feel limp anyway. Let's go in. Just a nip of champagne. Do you know the awful thing is I would like champagne very much. I'll have some champagne too. Very good, sir. What a life of pleasure. Roses, half an hour with the female pugilist, and now champagne. I wish you wouldn't keep going on about the roses. It wasn't my idea in the first place. Somebody sent them to Celia. Oh, that's quite different. That lets you out completely. But it does make my massage worse. Well, I did have the barber shave me in my room this morning. I'm glad about the roses. Frankly, they were a shock. They made me think we were starting the day on the wrong foot. All the next day, Julia and I spent together without interruption, talking sometimes scarcely moving, held by the swell of the sea. After luncheon, the last hardy passengers went to rest, and we were alone, as though the place had been cleared for us, as though tact on a titanic scale had sent everyone tiptoeing out to leave us to one another. We thought Papa might come back to England after Mummy died. Or that he might marry again. But he lives just as he did. Rex and I often go and see him now. I've grown very fond of him. And Sebastian? He's disappeared completely. Cordelia's in Spain with an ambulance. Bridey leads his own extraordinary life. He wanted to shut Bride's head after Mummy died. But Papa wouldn't hear of it for some reason. So Rex and I live there now. And Bridey too? He has two rooms next to Nanny Hawkins. Part of the old nurseries. One meets him sometimes coming out of the library or on the stairs. I never know when he's at home. And now and then he suddenly comes in to dinner like a ghost, quite unexpectedly. He's like a character from Chekhov. <laughs> you know, Charles Rex has never been unkind to me intentionally. It's just that he isn't a real person at all. He's a few faculties of a man highly developed. The rest simply isn't there. He couldn't imagine why it hurt me to find out two months after we came back to London from our honeymoon that he was still keeping up with Brenda Champion. I was glad when I found that Celia was unfaithful. I felt it made it all right for me to dislike her. Is she? 
Do you? I'm glad I don't like her either. Why did you marry her? Physical attraction. Ambition, everybody agrees she's the perfect wife for a painter. Loneliness. Missing Sebastian. You loved him, didn't you? Oh, yes. He was the forerunner. She told me, as though fondly turning the pages of an old nursery book, of her childhood. And I lived long, sunny days with her in the meadows, with Nanny Hawkins on her camp stool and Cordelia asleep in the pram. She told me of her life with Rex, and of the secret, vicious, disastrous escapade that had taken her to New York. She too had had her dead years. At first, I used to stay away with Rex in his friends' houses. He doesn't make me anymore. He was ashamed of me when he found I didn't cut the kind of figure he wanted. Ashamed of himself for having been taken in. I wasn't at all the article he bargained for. He can't see the point of me. But whenever he's made up his mind there isn't a point, and he's begun to feel comfortable, he gets a surprise. Some man or even woman he respects takes a fancy to me, and he suddenly sees there's a whole world of things we understand that he doesn't. He was upset when I went away. He'll be delighted to have me back. I was faithful to him until this last thing came along. When, before dinner, she went to get ready, I came with her, uninvited, unopposed, expected. I recall the courtships of the past ten dead years. How knotting my tie before setting out, putting the gardenia in my buttonhole, I would plan an evening of seduction and think, at such and such a time, at such and such an opportunity, I shall cross the start line and open my attack for better or worse. This phase of battle has gone on long enough, I would think, a decision must be reached. With Julia, there were no phases, no start line. No tactic at all. nothing like a good upbringing. Do you know, last year when I thought I was going to have a child, I decided to have it brought up a Catholic. I hadn't thought about religion before. I hadn't since. But just at that time, while I was waiting for the birth, I thought, that's the one thing I can give her. It doesn't seem to have done me much good, but my child shall have it. It was odd, wanting to give something one had lost oneself. Then, in the end, I couldn't even give her that. I couldn't even give her life. I never saw her. I was too ill to know what was going on. And afterwards, for a long time, until now, I didn't want to speak about her.
she was a daughter, so Rex didn't so much mind about her being dead. We'd argued endlessly about whether I should have a child in the first place. At first, I wanted one. After a year or so, I discovered that I'd have to have an operation to make it possible. By that time, Rex and I were out of love. But he still wanted an heir. It's late. Perhaps we'd better go to bed. I have been punished a little for marrying Rex. You see, I can't get all that sort of thing out of my mind quite. Death, judgment, heaven, hell. Nanny Hawkins and the catechism. It becomes part of oneself if they give it one early enough. And yet I wanted my child to have it. Now I suppose I should be punished for what I've just done. Perhaps that's why you and I are here together like this. Part of a plan. No, Charles, not yet. Perhaps never. I don't know. I don't know if I want love. Love? I'm not asking for love. Oh, yes, Charles. You are. They bring me some tea or something. I rang the bell. Next day the wind had dropped and again we were wallowing in the swell.
That day, because we had talked so much the day before, and because what we had to say needed few words, we spoke little. When, after long silences, we spoke at all, our thoughts, we found, had kept pace together, side by side. Standing guard over your sadness. It's all I've earned. You said so yesterday. My wages. And I owe you from life. Promise to pay on demand. It's the end of our day. Let's go on deck. I'm having for breakfast. Good Lord. I 
fixed up a visit to go to the hairdresser. You know, they couldn't take me till four o'clock this afternoon. They're so busy suddenly. Mm -hmm. So I shan't appear till this evening. But all sorts of people are coming this morning to see us. I'm afraid I've been a worthless wife to these last few days. What have you been up to? You've been behaving yourself. You haven't been picking up sirens. <laughs> Scarcely woman about. Now I've been talking to Julia. Oh, good. I always wanted to get you two together. She was one of my friends I knew you'd like. You must have been a godsend to her. Been through rather a gloomy time lately. I don't expect she mentioned it, but she got into trouble with an awful man. Here you've been looking after my husband for me. Yes, we've become very matey. Oh, Charles, do let's go and see what's going on. We'll catch you up. What are your plans? London for a bit. Celia's going straight down to the country. She wants to see the children. You too. No. In London, then. I missed it. There was such a crowd that side of the ship. I found out about trains and sent a telegram. Right. We should be home by dinner. The children will be asleep. Well, perhaps we could wake John John up just this once. Uh, you go down. I really have to stay in London. Oh, Charles, you must come. You haven't seen Caroline. Well, she changed much in a week or two. Oh, darling, she changes every day. But where's the point of seeing her now? I'm sorry, my dear, but I must get the pictures unpacked so I can see how they've travelled. I must get the exhibition fixed. Though. Must you? It's very disappointing. Besides, I don't know if Andrew and Cynthia will be out of the flat. They took it till the end of the month. Or I can go to an hotel. Oh, well, that's so grim. I can't bear you to be alone your first night home. I'll stay and go down tomorrow. Oh, now, you mustn't disappoint the children. No. Will you come down at the weekend? If I can. All British passport holders to the smoking room, please. All British passport holders to the smoking room. I've arranged for that sweet foreign office man at our table to get us off early. Good. Cavendish Hotel. Mr. Charles Ryder, please. Charles. Are you off to the gallery? I'm sick of the pictures already, and I never want to see them again, but I suppose I'd better put in an appearance. Do you want me to come? I'd much rather you didn't. Celia sent a card with Bring Everyone written across it in green ink. When do we meet? In the train. Could pick up my luggage. If you'll have it packed soon, I'll pick you up too and drop you at the gallery. I've got a fitting next door at 12. Lovely. See you in about an hour then. Bye.
Good morning. How's it going? Now, Charles, darling, do remember, be nice to the critics. Yes, darling. No one's come yet. I've been here since ten, and it's been very dull. Whose car was that you came in? Julia's. Julia's? Why didn't you bring her in? Oddly enough, I've just been talking about Brian's head to a funny little man who seemed to know us very well. He said he was called Mr. Samgrass. Apparently he's one of Lord Copper's middle-aged young men on the Daily Beast. I tried to feed him some paragraphs, but he seemed to know more about you than I do. He said he met me years ago at Brideshead. I wish Julia had come in. We could have asked her about him. No, no, I... I... You're whiskey, darling. Thank you. I remember him. He's a crook. Oh, yes. That stuck out a mile. He's been talking about what he calls the Brideshead set. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Rex Motron has turned the place into a nest of party mutiny. Did you know? What would Theresa Marchmain have thought? I'm going up there tonight. No, not tonight, Charles. You can't go tonight. You're expected at home. You promised as soon as the exhibition was ready you'd come home. John John and Nanny have made a banner with welcome on it. And you haven't seen Caroline yet. I'm sorry, it's all settled. Besides, Daddy will think it's so odd. The boy is home for Sunday. And you haven't seen the new studio. Charles, you can't go tonight. Did they ask me? Of course. But, but I knew you wouldn't be able to come. No, I can't now. I could have if you'd let me know earlier. I should adore to see the bride's head set at home. I do think you're perfectly beastly. This is no time for a family rumpus. The Clarence said they'd look in before luncheon. They may be here any minute. Good. Mr. Ryder. Parallelly, Max. Daily Mail. Oh, yeah. I wondered if I might have a word. I have no idea. Oh, here they are. Hey, please. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Yes, sir. What a very charming hat. <laughs> oh, sir, you are sweet. Interesting, this trip down the Amazon. One of my brothers has just got back. Got pretty bitten. Looking forward to seeing the pictures. How kind of you to come, sir. Very good to see you. Ah. What a glass of champagne. Not for me, I think. Pretty hot out there, I should think. Yes, it was, sir. Was it terribly uncomfortable? Well, ma'am, there were one or two pretty sticky moments. Awfully clever the way you hit off the impression of heat. Makes me feel quite uncomfortable in my great coat. <laughs> Just a little bit closer, please. That's it, fine. Lovely. Uh, Lovely. Can you see the picture? That's all right, no, I'm not interested in the picture. That's fine. Just a tiny bit closer. Lovely. Lovely. Now, smile, please. How come, Mr. John? I'm delighted to hear it. Oh, Charles! Charles! Sir John has been saying the most marvellous things about you. Oh, good. Yes. I'm glad. I think it's safe to say that we can look forward to another rider at the Tate. And now, if I may, I should like to mark down the following ones for, for further consideration. Number seven. You see, Charles lives for one thing. Beauty. I think he got bored with finding it ready-made. He had to go create it for himself. He wanted new worlds to conquer. After all, he has said the last word about country houses, really, hasn't he? <laughs> Not, I mean, that he's given that up altogether. I'm sure he'll always do one or two more for friends. Of course, he's going to be frightfully busy at the moment, getting the book ready. Have you subscribed? From fashionable and unfashionable lips alike, I heard fragments of praise. They all thought they had found something new. It had not been thus at my last exhibition in these same rooms, shortly before going abroad. Then there had been an unmistakable note of weariness. Then the talk had been less of me than of the houses, anecdotes of their owners.
<laughs> I remembered that last exhibition too for another reason. It was the week I had detected my wife in adultery. Then as now, she was a tireless hostess. Whenever I see anything lovely nowadays, a building, a piece of scenery, I think to myself, that's by chance. I see everything. Throughout our married life, again and again, I had felt my bowels shrivel within me at the things she said. But today in this gallery, I heard her unmoved and suddenly realized that she was powerless to hurt me anymore. I was a free man. She had given me my manumission in that brief, sly lapse of hers. My cuckold's horns made me lord of the forest. Darling, I must go. It's been a terrific success, hasn't it? I'll think of something to tell them at home. But I wish it hadn't had to happen quite like this. I have not brought a card of invitation. I do not even know whether I received one. I have not come to a social function. I do not seek to scrape acquaintance with Lady Celia. I do not want my photograph in the Tatler. I haven't come to exhibit myself. I've come to see the pictures. Perhaps you are unaware that there are any pictures here. I happen to have a personal interest in the artist. If that word has any meaning for you. Antoine, come in. My dear, there is a gorgon here who thinks I'm gate crashing. Dear Charles. How are you? <laughs> I only arrived in London yesterday and I heard quite by chance at luncheon that you were having an ex exhibition. So, of course, I dashed impetuously to the shrine to pay homage. Have I changed? W would you recognize me? Hmm? Now, where are the pictures? Let me explain them to you. Hmm. Where, my dear Charles, did you find this sumptuous greenery? In the corner of some hothouse at Trent or Tring? What a gorgeous usurer nurtured these fronds for your pleasure. I've been in South America for two years, haven't you heard? <laughs> I know all about that. <laughs> hmm. But they tell me, my dear, that you are happy in love. And that is everything, is it not? Or nearly everything. Are they as bad as that? My dear, let us not expose your little imposture before these good, plain people. Let us not spoil their innocent pleasure. We know, you and I, that this is all terrible tripe. Let's go before we offend the connoisseurs. I know of a loose little bark quite near here. Let's go there and talk of your other conquests. Thank you for everything. Not quite your milieu, my dear, but mine, I assure you. After all, you have been in your milieu all day. 
I was given the address by a dirty old man in the birth sur la Troie. I'm most grateful to him. I've been out of England so long, and really, sympathetic little joints like this change so fast. I presented myself here for, for the first time yesterday evening, and already I feel quite at home. Good evening, Cyril. Now, Tony, back again? Can't keep away, my dear. Which I'm in debt. What would you like, Charles? A gin and dragon. Uh, two of those, please. Huh. Hello, Tony. Uh, good evening. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. Uh, do you know Mr. Charles Ryder, uh, the artist? Pleased to meet you. How do you do? Uh, thank you. We'll take our drinks and sit down. You must remember, my dear, that here you are just as conspicuous and, may I say, abnormal, my dear, as I should be in Brass Club. Would your friend care to rumble? No, Tom, he would not, and I'm not going to give you a drink. Not yet, anyway. That's a very impudent boy. A regular little gold digger, my dear. Well, Antoine, what have you been up to all these years? My dear, it's proof of what you have been up to that we are here to talk about. I've been watching you, my dear. I'm a faithful old body, and I've kept my eye on you. I went to your first exhibition, my dear. I found it charming. There was an interior of Marsh Main House, very English, very correct, but c c quite delicious. Charles has done something, I said. Not all he will do, not all he can do, but something. Even then, my dear, I wondered a little. It seemed to me there was something a little gentlemanly about your painting. You must remember, my dear, that I am not English. I cannot understand this keen zest to be well-bred. English snobbery is even more macabre to me than English morals. However, I said, Charles has done something delicious. What will he do next? Imagine then my excitement at luncheon today. Everyone was talking about you. How you had broken away, my dear, gone to the tropics, become a, a Gauguin, a Rambo. You can imagine how my old heart leapt. Poor Cecilia, they said. After all she's done for him, he owes everything to her. It's too bad. And with Julia, they said. After the way she behaved in America, and just as she was going back to Rex. But with the pictures, I said, to tell me about them. Oh, the pictures, they said. They're most peculiar. Not at all what he usually does. Very forceful, quite barbaric. I call them downright unhealthy, said Mrs. Stuyvesant Oaklander. Oh, my dear, I could hardly keep still in my chair. I wanted to dash out of the house, leap into a taxi and say, take me to Charles's unhealthy pictures. Well, my dear, I went. And what did I find? I found a very naughty and successful but practical joke. It reminded me of the dear Sebastian when he liked so much to dress up in false whiskers. It was charm again, my dear. Simple, creamy English charm. Playing tigers. Quite right. Of course I'm right, my dear. I was right years ago. More years, I'm happy to say, than either of us shows. But when I warned you, I took you out to dinner to warn you of charm. I warned you expressly and in great detail of the flight family. Charm is the great English blight. It does not exist outside these damp islands. It spots and kills anything it touches. It kills love. It kills art. And I greatly fear, my dear Charles, that it has killed you. Nice seeing you again, Anthony. I've got to go. I've got a train to catch. Dommage. I so enjoy our little talks together. A bientôt, Charles.
Don't be a tease, Tony. Buy me a drink. Hmm? All right. I'll just go make sure the luggage is uh, safely stored. Thank you. We thought you'd miss the train. It seems days since I saw you. Six hours. And we were together all yesterday. You look worn out. Oh, it's been a nightmare of a day. Crowds, critics, and the Clarences. Ending up with half an hour's well-reasoned abuse about my pictures in a pansy bar. I think Celia knows about us. She had to know sometime. Would you care for a drink before dinner, madam? Two very dry martinis, please. Everyone seems to know. My pansy friend had only been in London 24 hours before he found out. Damn everybody. But what about Rex? Rex isn't anybody at all. He just doesn't exist. Why not? 
because uh, I don't much enjoy it. Who cares about divorce these days, anyway? A few old maids. <laughs> <laughs> if he has a show, then you may That exhibition of yours is divine. You enjoyed it. One third speech. How's that lovely speech? Yeah. Make them all of you strong. That's been so stupid at times. You've lost weight. And it suits you. Goodness, you look more stunning than ever. Like a Hello, everybody. Do carry on. I'm sorry I wasn't here to greet you. I hope Rex has taken care of you all. Good evening. How are you? Good evening, darling. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah, you look so cool, Thank you. I guess the evening down in Jameson. Where we did. How was it? Well, it's Lee's. This friend of Afghan, who takes what he's done down in the city, not Ohio, came straight into a military convoy. We couldn't stop him. Straight up, smack him on the tank. So he gave himself up for dead. Oh, no, this is the funny part. He drove clean through. Hello. Didn't even scratch his paint. It was made of canvas. Celia's art and fashion, or Rex's politics and money. Why worry about them? My darling. Why is it that love makes me hate the world? It's supposed to have quite the opposite effect. I feel as though all mankind and God too we're in a conspiracy against us. They are. They are. But we've got our happiness in spite of them. Here and now. We've taken possession of it. They can't hurt us, can they? Not now. Not tonight. Not for how many nights?
Thank you.